Afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Really good to see so many people here. Um, this talk is about um, TradeMe's journey to um, modernize its data stack to migrate from uh, primarily um, an on-prem SQL Server environment to uh, cloud um, Snowflake Data Warehouse and how, in the process, um, this project morphed from being a kind of simple lift and shift uh, cloud migration to a complete uh, re-architecture, redesign, um, total modernization of the tech stack. Um, and the way this came to be was by applying um, some product thinking to what we were doing, um, so sort of taking it away from being just a purely engineering product to thinking it more in terms of a, a product that we were building, um, thinking about who our customers were, how we could best serve them, what problems they had, the problems that we were trying to solve, um, and how DBT has, has helped us massively while we're doing that. A little bit about me. Um, my name's Lance. Um, my role is Data Modernization Lead at TradeMe. Um, I've been working with um, data and databases for around um, all over 20 years. Um, my first ever uh, job in IT was um, working on the Y2K bug. So yes, I am that old, and you're welcome. Um, uh, after working as a database developer, I went into um, to become an insights analyst, um, working at various banks. Um, and then eventually joined TradeMe about eight years ago as an insights analyst. Um, took a bit of time running a, a data products company that TradeMe owns, um, and a sort of product manager, project manager, um, and then back into analytics, um, where I'm now helping lead the team that's um, working on this data migration. Okay, a little bit of a, a context on um, TradeMe's data landscape. Um, for those of you on this side of the ditch unfamiliar with TradeMe, TradeMe is um, one of New Zealand's uh, largest, most popular websites. Um, started out very much as a, a second-hand goods um, exchange platform. Um, probably the nearest thing in Australia is Gumtree. Um, but over the years, um, it's sort of grown, accumulated. Um, so it has new goods, second-hand goods, has a property portal. Um, the largest property portal, the largest motors portal, second largest jobs portal um, in New Zealand. Um, all of which is built on top of a database that was originally designed for selling your second-hand heater to the guy down the road. So there's quite a bit of data legacy there. So that's why I describe this as with this 24-year-old, multi-billion dollar um, startup. Because a lot of the code that was originally written is sort of still hanging around um, or in the process of um, modernizing it. Um, the data landscape in production is primarily SQL Server. Um, um, recently in the cloud, but still on SQL Server. Um, and not really sure what constitutes big data these days, but um, uh, for, from our perspective, what we get is we get about 1.5 million new listings every day, uh, about 20 million listing views, about the same searches, um, about 26 million search results every hour, um, 2.5 million GA sessions, 75 million GA events um, coming through every day. Um, there's additional complexity because we have multiple businesses and satellite businesses. We've acquired businesses over the years, um, and the degree to which they've been integrated sort of ranges from not at all to a little bit less than not at all, um, which makes our data landscape more complex because we've got to try and bring, bring, bring stuff, bring more through. Okay, so like most people my age, I'm going to start by talking about the old days. Um, this is what. Um, TradeMe's data landscape looked like back before um, anyone had heard of the modern data stack. Um, so what we've got there in the middle is uh, where it says TM data. That was uh, that's our core SQL Server database on-prem. Um, and how that works is we take um, snapshots of the production databases every night, copy them onto this TM data server, run some ETLs to try and clean the data up a bit, um, and everything goes in there. Um, we also have some stuff looking at SAS, some SaaS platforms coming through. Uh, we've got an Athena data lake with data coming in and out. Um, Google Analytics data going in and out, satellite, um, satellite businesses, and some marketing tech um, with Power BI being used um, as our reporting layer. Um, all the orchestration is done um, using uh, uh, SSIS primarily um, with a bit of prefix stuff. And there is also some sort of ugly looking homebrew um, that's accumulated over the years that looks like it's going to stink or possibly explode in your face if you get too close to it. So we all just sort of try and leave that alone. So a few years ago, um, TradeMe migrates to the cloud. We're closing down our data center. TM Data lives in the data center. So obviously, we've got to switch it off. And that's when the decision was made to uh, migrate to Snowflake. Um, and that was done around 18 months ago. Uh, so we spent 18 months working on this project of uh, migrating everything over. And after a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, what we ended up with was this. 
it's the same bowl of spaghetti, but with a big snowflake-shaped meatball stuffed in there. Um, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice um, that one of the core sources for that snowflake database is actually the on-prem SQL Server database that we're trying to switch off, which is kind of like incorporating the scaffolding into the design of your new house. Um, nothing's been switched off. Everything's still going. Masses of additional complexity. You know, we're getting to the point where we're thinking, hey, maybe the homebrew doesn't look so bad after all. Let's just crack that open um, and call it a day. So, um, and so one of the additional problems was that because a lot of this stuff was built as a proof of concept in the grand tradition of proof of concepts in the data space, they become business critical. Um, people build reports off them, and you've got no way of switching them off. So, time for reports. A whole lot of us get together. We have some fairly robust conversations and decide things are getting pretty serious. So serious, in fact, that we have to employ not one, but two business cliches at the same time. It is time for a blue sky approach and some greenfield thinking. Excuse me. Sorry, talk amongst yourselves. Nervous speaker, dry throat. OK. So um, the big question that changed our approach um, and changed our direction was the one at the top there, which is we're in a meeting. We suddenly said, what if we didn't have a data warehouse today? What if TradeMe had never built a data warehouse? Would the data warehouse we want look anything like the one that we've currently got that we're trying to migrate to Snowflake? Um, if the answer is no, then we've all just got to admit we're wasting our time and we need to start again. The answer came out. Everyone said, no, it would not look like that. And the great thing about that question is it leads you to then, well, what do we want it to look like? What is this thing for? Um, and this is where we came up with the next important question, which is what product are we trying to build? Um, Part of the reason we've gone down the wrong route, I think, um, was that the initial project had been very much framed in terms of um, reporting. Um, quite rightly, our finance people and our commercial people were saying, if you're going to move this database, our reporting needs to keep working. And we were thinking of it in terms of reporting. And when you're thinking there, you're thinking continuity. You're thinking just copying and pasting what you've already got. What we re had to realize was that reporting is not our product. Reporting is a product that someone has built with our product. Our product is the data platform from which those reports are built. Our customers are not the commercial team. They're not the finance team. Our customers are the insights analysts who are building those reports. So what we need to do is build the product that they need to service their customers properly. So we're looking at who it's for, what problems are we trying to solve, and then from there, which tools do we need? Which skills do we need? And last business cliche of the day, how can we increase speed to customer value? People have been waiting 18 months for this thing already, and we're now just about to have that uncomfortable conversation where we go, actually, I think we're going to start again. So um, back to um, product thinking again, we thought we'd come up with a mission statement. And this was the mission statement that we came up with, was that it's to build a data warehouse that analysts love to use. Um, I'm sure we all have. We've all worked in places where there are data warehouses that um, we don't like. They're clunky, they're bad to use, and we all just kind of accept it as something you have to live with, like you know, taxation or you know, British weather or um, Eddie Jones. Um, too soon? Um, um, what we want is a data warehouse that our analysts, when they go to you know, barbecues with their analyst friends, they'll actually be showing off about this. Like, hey, the data warehouse where I work is so cool, it's so easy. You know? I don't have to do any data cleaning, it's awesome. Um, so that was, our, that was our North Star. There are a couple of asterisks on this slide. The first one is about the phrase data warehouse, which I really don't like. Um, a warehouse, to me, conjures up um, images of, of storage, of putting things away. It's like the final scene in Indiana Jones where the guy goes and puts the big box in the dark room for no one ever to see again. Um, the way I want people to think about data warehouse is more of a library. A library is a place that's sort of um, configured and designed for the easy retrieval of information. It should be a place that you want to go to. If you know what you want, you go straight there, and there it is. If you don't know what you want, it's easy to browse, look around, find some cool stuff, and you might actually enjoy something, um, enjoy yourself, and learn some stuff in the process. Um, the second asterisk is by analysts, because analysts, we know, are not our only customer. They're our primary customer. If we have to choose, um, we will always um, uh, go towards analysts first, but we do realize that there are data scientists, commercial analysts, um, uh, marketing analysts who are also going to use our platform. OK, the problems that we were trying to solve. 
The first one was conscious coupling. Um, uh, we had a major problem in that um, our data warehouse was very, very tightly coupled with our production databases. Um, because of this nightly snapshotting, we basically just take a copy of production, um, we basically go, oh, yeah, that looks like a DIM table, that looks like a fact table, put that name in front of it, and it's pretty much the production database um, uh, copied as a, and we called it a data warehouse. Um, this was so bad, in fact, that um, I was talking to our CTO who was actually saying that um, as, we're, as he was trying to split um, our application up into more microservices, he actually couldn't because this tight coupling of uh, the production database to the data warehouse meant that breaking things off um, was just going to have this massive blast radius and break everything. So data, rather than being something that drives the business, was actually something that was slowing the business down. I'm sure we're all familiar with this. Um, semantic nightmares where you've got uh, 15 different columns in 15 different cases for the same thing. Um, Trade Me's core product is a listing. Um, I think we've got 18 different variations on listing ID, uh, reference ID, auction ID, classified ID. No, um, horrendous. And they don't always mean listing ID. Um, arcane knowledge, again, probably something that we all suffer from. This is the stuff that you just know. It's not written down anywhere. Um, you need to know the person that's been working there for five years, like go find the old man living in a cave with a white beard, and if you answer his three riddles, he'll tell you how we, how we calculate audience engagement. Um, being that old guy has been fantastic for my uh, job security over the years, um, but it's not scalable and it's not sustainable. Uh, multiple sources of truth in this. Um, because nobody actually knows where the core data source is or where it comes from. Uh, you end up with lots of different reports, um, lots of different sources, um, and no one's even sure which one is the right one when you want to reconcile them together. Um, going back to the well, because of this nasty um, homebrew stuff that we delivered, um, what we tended to do when we needed to get data from the likes of Salesforce or NetSuite was just get exactly what we need and no more. Which means every time an analyst has a new request, it has to go back into the data engineering um, uh, pipeline uh, takes for ages to get through, which means the analysts, you know, analysts are like water, they'll find a way. Um, they'll go and put it in a spreadsheet or stick it in Power BI or something. Um, and you end up with more infrastructure and more cognitive load. Um, stored, pro stored procs of death. Um, I made a great career out of writing lots of these things, um, but they're um, distinctly not fashionable anymore. This is where you've just got thousands and thousands of lines of SQL all in one big stored proc uh, or inside um, a Power BI report, even worse. Um, uh, which all need to be retired, and nobody understands them. Uh, Incident-driven development. Um, because we've got no lineage, we've got no, um, no idea of a downstream impact, we've got no idea of blast radius. Um, if we release something to production, the way we know it's, it's broken is because of the screaming and the, the, the you know, torches and the pitchforks um, that come to the um, data department when a marketing campaign, campaign breaks. So we need to get that sorted. Uh, privacy concerns. Um, while most of the sensitive data from our production systems is scrubbed before it gets to the data warehouse, there was still stuff like um, email addresses and phone numbers lying around. Um, excuse me. Um, the Wild Insights analyst should have access to this stuff. You don't really necessarily just want to leave it lying around. Um, so we needed to do a better job of handling that. Um, and all of this was very difficult to solve in our existing architecture. So. After having these discussions, we take it all to the CTO, um, and we basically ask for permission to start again. Um, basically, nuke the whole thing from orbit, new Snowflake account, new, archi new architecture, um, new technology, um, new tools, and we said, please, can we do that? And he said, yes. And we said, oh, shit. Um, <laughs> we actually have to do something about this now. It is extreme, extremely easy to stand there on the sidelines pointing out all these problems. Um, but then when suddenly someone says, yeah, sweet, go fix it, um, then you've got a whole new problem to think about. So my recommendation to anybody who finds themselves in this situation is have a plan to beat. You've got to have a plan, and you've got to realize that your plan is rubbish, and it's never going to work. And then you need to find some really smart people, put that plan in front of them. And you know, like Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, basically, you put your plan in front of these um, uh, smart people and let them hopefully metaphorically, um, punch you in the face until your plan becomes good. So this was the original plan. Um, I scribbled on a whiteboard um, when I first came up with it. Um, it's sort of far more productive. Um, like a really bad way of coming up with a plan is putting 10 people in a room and say, let's come up with a plan. Instead, put those 10 people in a room, give them your plan, and let them rip it to shreds, and then they will come up with something far better. So um, the uh, final plan looks a little bit like that. Um, 
uh, but it's changed in almost every detail. The main thing is, is though, we stuck with these core principles. Limiting the tools and methods. Um, essentially, buy before build, if we possibly can. Um, if there's one way of doing something, we want it to be done that way throughout. Um, even if there's a little bit of extra work up front, we want that cognitive load to be reduced. Setting roles and responsibilities. Um, it's sort of became a thing over the years where if you've got data in your job title, then you can do everything that is related to data. Um, you know, you're expected to be able to run pipelines, build data science models, be a data visualization expert. Um, we need to work out what skill sets people have, uh, stretch them across the business to make sure we've got this sort of full data end-to-end -end flow. Land all the things. Um, data storage cost is no longer an issue. Um, we don't want to have to keep going back to NetSuite every time there's a new column or a table we need. Just get everything in raw, and we can worry about what we need later. Um, a big paradigm shift for us was um, structuring data for end users, no longer being tied to what our, app, our production applications look like, um, and instead structuring the data for how analysts want to see it. You should not have to understand all the eccentricities of our production system to be able to derive insights for your stakeholders. Apply some semantic discipline, no more antonyms, no synonyms. Um, you know, let's have some conventions. We're all going to fight to the death for whether it's commas at the beginning or commas at the end. But you know, we'll just agree on one and stick to it. Auto documentation was a massive one, um, so we can get away with uh, remove all that arcane knowledge and have everything written down. Um, and move to a single source of truth, multiple version of truth model. So um, rather than having your business logic liberally scattered like pixie dust around your um, data platform, um, you put it all in one place um, as early as possible, and then you can build multiple versions of truth from there. Um, similar on the theme, uh, don't repeat yourself. Um, and when you do the initial one, do it as early in the stack as you possibly can. So this is the tech stack we came up with. Um, we have an in-house. Um, CDC that does all the um, uh, our production databases, but we use Stitch for third-party ingestion. Um, everything from whichever source it goes to ends up in JSON format in um, uh, S3 or GCP bucket, snow piped into Snowflake. Um, we use Terraform for the um, IAC and access control and all that kind of good stuff. And then all the real heavy lifting is done by dbt. Um, all the modeling is done there, all the orchestration is done there, with a little bit of stuff that's done in prefect when it needs to be asynchronous. Um, we use high touch to push data out to um, uh, third party systems, like if we're sending data out to segment or we need to send stuff like that into Salesforce or NetSuite, we use high touch um, and Power BI, I believe that's the old logo, um, is still used for data visualization. So um, we've gone from this big ugly bowl of spaghetti um, to this slightly less ugly bowl of spaghetti. Um, and what this means now is Snowflake is the only game in town. If you want data, Snowflake is where you get it from. You're not going off into the data lake anymore. You're not going into BigQuery anymore. If there's, if there's data, it's all coming into that central repository. Uh, we can all be joined together. Um, and it's all there for you to use. OK. To make this happen, um, we needed to slightly change our operating model. Um, uh, back in the old days, there I go again. Um, we used to have uh, BI developers. Um, and as time went by and that role became unfashionable, the BI developers became data engineers. Um, we've always had insights analysts. Um, but it kind of left that big gap in the middle of people that really just know how to, good, how to do data modeling. Um, some data engineers know how to do it well. Some insights analysts know how to do it well. Um, but it is a skill, and it's a specific skill, um, and it needs to be focused on. So we made a call very early that we would employ specific analytics engineers who would be the interface between um, the business end um, you know, with the insights analysts and the more technical end with the data engineers. Um, having said that, there is a difference between roles and people. So that's why it's a Venn, di Venn diagram. Um, people, insights analysts, can do analytics engineering work, so can data engineers. But we want them to be conscious of when they're doing that work, they are being an analytics engineer at the time. They've got their analytics engineering hat on, and that's the way they behave, and they, they stick with the rules and conventions accordingly. Here is our data architecture. Um, let's just see if this works. I've always wanted to do this. Um, amazing restraint for me to not make light cyber noises while I do this. Um, OK, so here's our di data architecture. Um, the data basically goes through two main journeys. Oh, sorry, I'll just go back. Um, so in the middle there, you see we've got our raw data where it gets landed. Um, everything gets staged. Some of it goes into intermediate. We then have this data warehouse layer. 
So this is where everything's um, sort of fully Kimball Snowflake schema. And then down here we have our data marts. Um, and then underneath there we have some reference data databases like for master data, um, reference data, and some restricted stuff. Um, but the two main journeys it goes through is up here, the data is structured and named for source system requirements. So um, up here, it's how NetSuite sees the world. So, um, you know, in, in Salesforce, a customer is called an account, and that's fine. It can be called an account there. We think of it as a customer. So when it gets below that layer, it's called customer, not account. So down here, the data is structured and named for the end user requirements for our insights analyst. So it makes sense to them. Um, the other journey we're doing is over here. Um, the data is um, organized by source. So each of these is a source. So this could be NetSuite all the way down. This could be Salesforce all the way down. Um, and then under here, it is uh, um, organized by business area. So for our property vertical, uh, our commercial team, our marketing team. Um, so the way it works is you have your single sources of truth along here. Um, and then the data marts are basically just collections of uh, those. So if I'm an insights analyst in our vertical business, I might want some uh, revenue data from NetSuite, I might want some customer data from Salesforce, I might want some uh, events data, I might want some data from our core app. I just go filter, combine it, and I put it there into my data mart. So this is how that looks um, as a DAG. This is a DAG that brings me great pleasure. It's like an hourglass on its side. Um, and the way it works is all the torturous business logic is done here. An insights analyst ideally shouldn't have to know anything about any of that stuff. Um, this is our listing table, by the way. The one in the middle is uh, uh, for where all trade music core listings are kept. So you've got this horrible business logic out there, all these hundreds of tables that go in towards creating it, and there is our single source of truth. Everything you could possibly want to know about a listing is in that one table. So over here are multiple versions of truth where um, you see we've got a data science exposure there at the bottom. We've got um, vertical specific groups of here. We've got summary tables. Um, so, but they all come from that single source of truth. So if we need to change some business logic, uh, we need to add some columns, we do it once on the left there, and everybody gets the benefit. Another way of looking at it is everything to the right of the listing table is canon. If you want to go back here and do something yourself and you don't like what Harry and Hagrid get up to, you know, that's on you. You know, come back to us, come back to the path. If it's to the right of that table, you know, we've got you. Okay. So why dbt? Um, primarily because um, it was SQL based. Um, back when we were looking at getting insights analysts to do the data modeling, um, we looked at some sort of these low code, no code tools and all the data insights analysts were just saying to us, can we just write SQL? Um, so yes, we got dbt. Um, the fact that everything's in one place, um, you know, if I'm working on, particularly if I'm working on something at a data mart where I need to be getting data from loads of different sources, the fact that it's all just sitting here in this directory structure makes it really easy. And we've got a great CI CD pipeline um, set up. So you've got your dev environment. Um, then when you want to do a PR, it does a zero copy clone of production uh, into its own schema, applies all your changes, runs all the tests. Um, so massively reduces the chances of releasing a breaking change. Not entirely, but um, significantly. Um, encourages modularity so that um, where we've got where previously we had these bits of business logic scattered everywhere, you now write it once and it applies everywhere. Um, testing is built in. Um, and having documentation as you go um, is a, a real game changer for us. OK, so on the subject of documentation as you go, one thing we, we realized was that everybody hates writing documentation. DBT does make it easier, but it still is um, a little bit painful um, if you've got to go and type out, um, particularly if you've got like a 40 column table. Um, so what we did was we came up with this macro called auto model YAML. Um, and what you do is you pass in um, a database and a schema, and it generates some SQL. And then you go and run that SQL on Snowflake, and it's basically just a query on the information schema that reformats your uh, entire database schema into a model's YAML file. I mean, it's not ChatGPT. It won't write all the descriptions and stuff. Um, but because we've got the um, uh, good discipline on the column names and table names and stuff, it will automatically generate, it, it knows when something's a unique key or a foreign key, and it will generate those tests for you. So you can just copy and paste that into your YAML file, write in your descriptions, hopefully, um, and there you've got your documentation already written. Um, auto PII handling. Um, this is going back to our CTO again, flushed with um, optimism after he said yes to the last thing I asked him for. Um, I went back and said, hey, 
it would make life a whole lot easier if we could upgrade to Snowflake Enterprise Edition and then I could use all the auto hashing. And he said, what else you got? So this is, this is what else we got. We had to do it uh, by hand. So the way we do it is we use uh, tagging. Um, so in our raw sources, uh, we find anything that's uh, got PII and we give it a tag. So there you can see we've got PII email, uh, PII phone, um, whatever else there are. Um, then the code gen that generates all our staging tables reads through those and if it finds there's a column with one of those tags on it, it just automatically hashes it in the staging table so it never makes it further than raw. There's then another, um, uh, another code gen which generates um, tables in our restricted schema and what it does is it goes through all those and it creates the lookups. So it goes, go back to the raw table, find the original value, find the hash value, copy that into a table in our restricted schema, um, and there's your lookup table. Um, so all our insights analysts have access to the restricted schema, but they need to change roles when they do so. Um, and so everything there is um, logged. So you know, if you're using it for um, accepted purposes, that's fine. If you're going in and downloading our entire customer list every month, then it looks dodgy, and someone will come up to you and say, hey, are you selling our customer data, and where's my cut? <laughs> we have landed all the things. Um, this is the number of tables we have um, in our data platform at the moment, split by source, and as you can see, we have basically just gone select star from NetSuite, select star from Salesforce, um, select star from any SaaS product we have, and we've chucked it in there. Um, and then we're working our way through staging it um, and putting some of it into warehouses and marts. Um, so we're still pretty early in the journey. I'm expecting there'll be a lot of stuff in raw that we'll never stage. Um, but it's, you know, it's great to have it if somebody needs it. Um, it's very easy to go and model it and get it done. OK, so the, um, the best thing about DBT um, is it um, dramatically narrows the aperture of the two hard basket. There is stuff that we would, have, have, we would never have considered doing um, in the old world that in DBT we go, ah, oh, yeah, just give it a nudge. When you can um, completely recreate your entire data platform with one uh, line on a command line, it just gives you that freedom to try stuff that you would never have previously done. Um, for example, uh, we were finding that our Snowflake costs were quite high because we were uh, constantly reloading lots of data from raw. Um, we realized that we could fix that if we just changed the metadata columns on every single one of our tables. Um, it's probably about 300 models at that point. Um, in the old world, you would have had to go and handcraft 300 store procs and 300 DMLs, um, probably another 300 um, staging, uh, staging store procs. Instead, we just did one macro change, um, told everyone, hey, stay off the data warehouse tonight, um, did a full, full rebuild, and we halved our snowflake costs overnight. Um, Yeah, so um, it just really encourages you to just rapidly iterate, uh, try out stuff, and um, you know what we said before about um, increasing the speed to customer value. Um, it's really helped us be able to put stuff out. We can let analysts have a try. If they don't like it, if there's something wrong, we can go back and very quickly fix it, um, rather than this sort of big bang approach which we were doing with the original migration. <clears throat> the important thing with that um, build first and optimize later approach, though, is that you then do actually go on and optimize. Um, and that's a lot of the stuff we've been working on now. So for example, um, we've um, recreated our own version of the source macro um, so that every time you um, use source from a raw, uh, source from a raw table, um, it only grabs the most recent delta. It just has an automatic thing in there which says, um, only find me stuff that's been loaded since the last time I did a load from this, from this database, for, sorry, from this table. Um, we created customized uh, incremental materializations. We've got our own incremental SCD2 and our own incremental, which again also have this um, delta timestamp. Um, and the SCD2 stores every state of every row and raw uh, going back, so we can actually recreate the data warehouse entirely from a point in time um, if we want to. Um, yeah, and all the, um, the incremental models have incremental predicates in them as well. Um, so. Uh, because we know it's always got that fixed point in time, so we can make sure that when we're merging back in, we're only merging from that point. Um, incremental predicates have the downside, though, that the, um, ooh, I'm over time, sorry, that was mostly coughing. Um, 
Um, the incremental predicates have uh, this sort of big downside where you actually have to hard code a time in. Um, because of the weird way that our application works, you can have a listing that's like five years old that suddenly uh, reappears again. Um, so we couldn't do that. So we've created our own thing called merge hints, um, where you can actually say merge into this table, join on this key, um, but only look from the earliest date of the table I'm merging from onwards, um, whatever that might be. If it is 10 years old, it's not going to help you. But in some cases, if it's a recent one, um, you do get a lot of performance benefit. And again, we've seen our snowflake costs um, drop since we've implemented this. <sighs> what next? Um, basking in the warm glow of exclusively positive user feedback. Um, to be fair, it has been mostly positive so far. Our marketing team is really happy with us because we're now refreshing hourly. They used to have to wait daily to get information before they could send uh, uh, marketing campaigns out. They can now do that hourly um, with high touch hitting segment. Um, but yeah, we're learning a lot of stuff. We've got enough users on there now that um, we're getting some really good feedback. Um, but people are using the platform in earnest, which is great. Um, which means we can finally start putting some of the old architecture out of its misery. We don't even, the stuff that we don't understand, we now think, well, we're never going to have to understand it. We can just switch it off, which is great. Saves a lot of time and cost and cognitive load. Um, looking at improving monitoring and master data management. Um, we're starting to look at well, what technologies we might use for that. Um, and this is really exciting, is building for Trabe's new technology. So Trabe is moving to a, a more eventing architecture. Um, and we're starting to now consume those events and create, um, uh, create warehouses with those events, which means we can actually do a proper conscious uncoupling um, from those production databases. Um, so we're hoping that in the future our data warehouses won't have to rely on our production databases at all. And then applying it to other projects. Um, luckily, um, as we were sort of coming towards building out this project, um, the finance team um, got in touch with us and said, we're doing this big project to um, uh, restructure all our billing systems. And what we need is a way of kind of getting data from all these systems into one central place and then putting it out again. And we were like, ha have we got something for you? And it's written in a way that we could pretty much just copy and paste it over, um, change some of the business logic, and we had that thing up and running in, in two weeks. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, and that is me. Thank you very much.